Today we're continuing in our, our series looking at the book of Acts. And today we're going to be looking about how the good news of Israel's Messiah having come, if that's good news for everyone, is that good news for all? And throughout this series, through the book of Acts, we want to focus our attention upward towards love of God, but also outward in love for our neighbour, that we might be filled up in order that we might be sent out. And Acts uh, 8 through to 12, which is the little passage we're going to be looking at today, is a story of how the Jerusalem based Jewish Messianic community becomes a multi ethnic international community. And this section begins with the stoning of Stephen, the very first Christian martyr. And we're told how uh, he was killed whilst he was preaching about Jesus of Nazareth being the Messiah. That Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. And so we read here in Acts uh, 7, 55 through to 58. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked intently towards heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they covered their ears, shouting out with a loud voice and rushing at him with one intent. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. So here we see the religious leaders are outraged because of Stephen's association of Jesus, who was killed outside Jerusalem with being the glory of God and standing at the right hand of God. And we're told that uh, following this incident, that a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were forced to scatter throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And the next section of Acts is all about breaking down those barriers, those walls of separation between various peoples. In Ephesians 2.14, uh, Paul writes, For he, that is Christ, is our peace, the one who made both groups into one and who destroyed the middle wall of partition, the hostility. And this a uh, section of Acts that we're looking at today is all about those barriers falling, the destroying that middle wall of partition, the hostility between peoples in order that Christ might be our peace, our shalom, our harmony that brings unity amongst people. So, friends, are you wall destroyers today? Are you breaking down those barriers between people? Christ is our shalom. He is our peace. And the first barrier that is, is ripped down is between the Jews and the Samaritans. And there if you see my PowerPoint. I've got some modern day Samaritans uh, worshipping on Mount Gerizim. And Samaria is in the blue section on the PowerPoint. And the, the, the Jewish Messianic community has been based in Judea, in Jerusalem. And now they're going north, they're scattering to the Samaritans. And the Samaritans are, are um, recorded in the Book of Kings as being a mixed people, as it were. When the northern kingdom of Israel was displaced by the Assyrians, they brought other tribes and other peoples into the area. And they bred and they mixed together with the northern Israelites and became a mixed people. And they worshipped Yahweh, they worshipped the God of Israel, um, but they weren't... Um, they were a mixed people and they had their own sacred mountain of on uh, Mount Gerizim and they also had uh, their own priesthood descended from Aaron and in Acts 8 uh, 12 through to 17 we read but when they believed Philip as he is proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They began to be baptized, both men and women, even Simon. And we're going to find out more about Simon. Simon himself believed. And after he was baptized, he stayed close to Philip constantly. And when he saw the, the signs and the great miracles that were occurring, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that 
those in Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. These two went down and prayed for them so they would receive the Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on the Samaritans and they believe and they received, sorry, the Holy Spirit. So this um, in this passage, we see about the Samaritans uh, received John's baptism. They see baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, water baptism the baptism of john but john had prophesied that one greater would baptize with the holy spirit and with fire and so they haven't received that baptism which comes from christ the the spirit baptism and that's what they needed and so having received water baptism they were now receiving the holy spirit from the apostles and uh, this is the first overspill of the Holy Spirit as he's poured out upon a new group outside of uh, Judaism, as it were. And uh, this is important because um, the Holy Spirit can come upon people, but now he's coming in us, he's, he's filling us. And so for these Jews, they're suddenly seeing the Samaritans, those people they didn't get on with, those people they resented or uh, disliked, um, suddenly being filled with the presence of God. Suddenly the people who are not a people are now being called my people. And this is a barrier busting moment as Samaritans and Jews didn't get on. And so suddenly the spirit is coming in the Samaritans. Is They're being filled with the spirit. They're receiving the Holy Spirit. And suddenly God saying, I'm not dwelling on this mountain or in Jerusalem. I'm dwelling in spirit and in truth. It's those who want to worship God must do so in spirit and in truth and they receive the spirit so they might worship god truly and we're told here that simon magus simon the sorcerer as he's often known receives water baptism but then he tries to buy the spirit because he's craving power friends this is a warning to all of us do we want signs do we want miracles do we want the gifts of the spirit um, on god's terms or ours do we want them to see god glorified or ourselves glorified simon the sorcerer is a warning that some of those who are baptized some of those who carry the name of christian are not actually changed on the inside they desire power they desire control rather than servanthood and humility uh, john white a vineyard um leader had a whole series of children's books i put them up there um like the chronicles of narnia but on this very theme uh, and it's based upon prophets and sorcerers and how some who claim to be prophets are actually sorcerers desiring only power and control over others and all of us must be on our guard um in this respect and in this next section um so we talk um we're told about the conversion of the ethiopian eunuch and ethiopia has a long history within the bible in genesis one of the rivers flowing out of eden flows out into ethiopia uh, in numbers 12 verse 1 we're told that moses um had a wife who's from cush from and which the king james version uh, renders as ethiopia and this, to many uh, later Jewish legends and sources, uh, describes how Moses, as that prince of Egypt, um, goes down uh, during a war to Ethiopia and then marries this beautiful black princess from Ethiopia. And so, you know, the, all these legends spring up and all these other ideas. And in Second Kings 19, verse 9, and Isaiah uh, 37 verse 9 we're told that a rumor reaches the Assyrians as they surrounded King Hezekiah about the mighty king Turkana of Ethiopia is marching in order to save Hezekiah and this king of Ethiopia is actually Pharaoh of Egypt um, because at this time the Kushites of Ethiopia and Sudan had conquered Egypt and were ruling it as the 25th dynasty and in Jeremiah 38, we find uh, Ebed Melech, another Ethiopian eunuch, rescuing the prophet Jeremiah from the well and saving his life. And so we can see that the, the history of Ethiopia is tied with the, the story of Israel in many respects. 
And here in Acts 8, we're told about the conversion of this Ethiopian eunuch. And we're told in verses 27 to 30, uh, we read, um, there he met an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, sitting in his chariot, reading from the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran up to her, ran up to it and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. And he asked him, what do you understand what you are reading? And here we get a, a glimpse of this man, who he was. He's the royal treasurer of Ethiopia. Uh, he's been castrated. That's why he's called a eunuch. Um, but he's also wealthy enough in order that he has his own uh, Isaiah scroll. And there was many Jewish communities throughout Egypt and perhaps as far south as Cush as Ethiopia. And he appears to be a God fearer, a, a non Jewish Ethiopian who's traveled to worship at the court of the Gentiles within the temple. And we're told that he's reading Isaiah. And there's a wonderful passage in Isaiah that speaks the good news to eunuchs and to the nations. And perhaps this is why he's so familiar with the prophet Isaiah, that he's gaining all this um, self-worth and other ideas as an outsider, perhaps, in some ways, to the people of Israel. And here we see Isaiah 58, 3 to 7, we read, Don't let foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord say, um, I will never be part of his people. Don't let the eunuch say, I'm dried up tree with no children and no future. For this is what the Lord says. I will bless those eunuchs who keep my Sabbath day holy and who choose to do what pleases me and commit their lives to me. For I will give them within the walls of my house a memorial, a name far greater than sons and daughters could give. For the name I give is an everlasting one and it will never disappear. And I also bless the foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord, who serve them and love his name, who worship him and do, who serve him and love his name, who worship him and do not desecrate the Sabbath day of rest, who hold fast to my covenant. And I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem. I will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. So we can imagine this uh, Ethiopian eunuch having read this passage and saying, yes, that's me, you know, and he's traveled for the pilgrim feast to Jerusalem, you know, whether it was for um, uh, Passover or, or Pentecost or perhaps both. And he's just stayed in Jerusalem the whole period. And now he's traveling back to Ethiopia because he's the treasurer uh, in the court of the queen. Um, and so you can see that he's getting this identity. He's one of those foreigners. He's one of those eunuchs who is actually called uh, blessed in the sight of God because he's joined himself to the covenant people of Israel. And I, I first saw this passage um, on a wall of a monastery um, up in Yorkshire. Um, you know, and you can just imagine the monks and those who've devoted themselves uh, to having no wives and no children reading this passage and saying, that's me. I, I can't say I'm a dried up tree with no children and no future, but rather God is going to give me uh, a name, a memorial far greater than sons and daughters could give. Just clean, holding on to that promise. And you can imagine this Ethiopian eunuch holding on to that promise that God's going to give me a name that is far greater than sons and daughters. And so we read here in Acts 8, 35 to 38. So Philip started speaking and beginning with this scripture, which is about the suffering servant, proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. And now as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is some water. Uh, what is to stop me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Uh, so here we see Philip sharing this good news of Jesus being the Messiah. Um, and this man becomes the first non-Jewish African in order to accept Christianity long before any European. And this is the second barrier being smashed down. So the first is the Samaritans. Here we've got an African 
a non-Jew who's now had this barrier smashed. And also he's, he's a eunuch. He's someone who has a disability, which would mean he can't enter into the temple. Uh, someone who's forbidden to enter into the temple because he's a Gentile, but also because he is um, a eunuch. And so here we see also someone with a disability, someone who's outside of the purity rites and the, the ritual um, of being pure is now entering into the covenant of God and the spirit comes and fills him again. You know, um, we don't see that specifically in this passage, um, but is someone entering into the people of God? Uh, and Luke takes now a break of this barrier smashing in order to introduce Saul and his own burning bush uh, conversion moment as he meets Christ, um, just as Moses had met the angel of the Lord. And I spoke about that a few weeks ago, so I'm not going to repeat it here. But then Luke follows Paul's trouble within the Messianic community, within this um very Jewish community. They're all Jews. They're all obeying the law of Moses. They're all meeting every day in the temple courts. Um, but the man who's been hunting them down is now the man who is preaching the good news, preaching Christ. And this causes tension within the community. Is, is this man just pretending? Is he genuine? Is it a trick so that he can find out their numbers and find out who they are? Is he then going to come in the middle of the night and arrest them all? And this is something that Christians all over the world face. Uh, when people from other religions, other communities convert to Christianity and they wonder, are these people genuine? Is this going to be a source of persecution for us? Um, it can cause great anxiety among Christian believers and in Christian communities. Is this governed, government official who's just converted? Are they genuine? Are they just trying to suss out our numbers or whatever else it may be? Um, so in Acts 10, Luke tells us about the next barrier breaking moment. And this is conversion of another non-Jew to uh, Cornelius to Christianity. And this is not the first time that non-Jews have responded to the good news, because but it's the first involving Peter, who is the de facto leader of the move movement. And this event probably occurs between uh, 39 and 40 AD. So this is sort of like 10 years after the death and the resurrection of Christ, and perhaps seven years after uh, Paul's conversion. And so we're told here in Acts 10, 1 through to 5. Now there's a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion, um, that was known as a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. He was a devout, God-fearing man, uh, as were all of his household. Uh, he did many acts of charity for the people and prayed to God regularly. And about three o'clock one afternoon, uh, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, sta staring at him and becoming greatly afraid, Cornelius replied, what is it, Lord? And the angel said to him, your prayers and your acts of charity have gone up as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon, who is called Peter. So here we go. Here we've got this uh, Cornelius. Uh, he's a centurion. He's also from the Italian cohort that makes uh, most likely he's ethnically an Italian. He's employed in the region as a soldier of the occupying empire. So you can imagine he's probably not the most uh, liked figure, perhaps a slightly unpopular figure, but he is described as a God fearer, a non-Jew who worships Israel's God. Uh, and we're told that he prays and he does lots of acts of charity and he's praying at three o'clock. So, again, this is the dedicated hour of prayer at the temple where the evening sacrifices begin. Um, and so while he's forbidden to enter the temple because he is a, a, a Gentile, he can go into the court of the Gentiles, of course. Um, and he's joining in within the temple worship by joining in their hour of prayer as best as he can. And he's probably regularly attending the local synagogue. He's probably part of the synagogue community as a God-fearer, okay? And at midday, the following day, Peter is praying on the roof, uh, another set time of prayer at the temple, and also receives a vision, Acts 10, 11 through to 16. And he saw heaven opened and an object, something like a large seat descending, uh, being let down to earth on its four corners and 
In it were all kinds of four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and wild birds. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, slaughter and eat. But Peter said, certainly not, Lord, for I have never eaten anything defiled and richly unclean. And the voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has made clean, you must not consider richly unclean. And this happened three times. And immediately the object was taken up into heaven. So Peter and Cornelius here uh, connect. And in verse 28, we read that Peter said, you know what is unlawful for a Jew to associate um, or visit with a Gentile. Yet God has shown me that I call no person defiled or ritually unclean. Think about Paul's, uh, Peter's words here for a moment. So we've got Peter. He's the, the leader, the de facto leader of the Messianic Jewish movement, as it were. Um, and God's working on his heart. Until this day, he's considered all Jews as defiled and ritually unclean. He isn't willing to go into their homes. He isn't willing to eat with them. And yet God is working to break down those barriers within his mind. To Peter, get rid of Peter's wrong attitudes. This European, this Italian, who Peter thought of as defiled, thought of as unclean, whose very presence could pollute him, God was calling his own. The spirit was going to come upon him and come in him. God's very spirit was going to go in this person who... Peter would write off as unclean, ritually impure, and yet God was going to say mine. Perhaps an analogy would be um, the untouchables in India in the caste system. You know, people who you're not even going to talk to, not go near to, are yet the people who God says mine. God says mine. You're mine. I'm going to go in you. God's very presence is going to come upon them. And so we read here in verses 34 to 36, then Peter started speaking. I now truly understand that God does not show favoritism in dealing with people, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is welcomed before him. You know, the message he sent to the people of Israel, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, for he is Lord of all. What a confession of Peter here. What a lovely moment of the melting of his own heart and his own prejudice towards the goy, the, the nations, the, the, the Gentiles. Uh, for this man is a worshipper of the God of Israel. He's not someone who's worshipping idols and, and being polluted by idolatry. This is a person who worships the God of Israel and who the God of Israel says, you're mine. I'm going to come in you by, your, by the spirit. What a confession of Peter. I now truly understand that God does not show favoritism in dealing with people. And this is a warning to all of us about our own pride. God's family is multinational. It's multiracial. When we see those pictures of heaven in the book of Revelation, when we see the worship before the throne of God, is people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, all worshipping together the God of Israel. And this should... Uh, affect how we view the world as well and I just want to challenge us we're, we're um, a nation which has a state church um, the Anglican church and yet there's more Anglicans who go to church so that's not people who put their names on a census or anything else but who go to church on a Sunday morning in Nigeria than in England Nigeria therefore is more Anglican than England okay there's another statistic you often hear. More Chinese go to church on a Sunday uh, than across the whole of Europe. Again, this isn't people who tick on a census, I'm a Christian, but people who actually regularly attend church. By In 2020, two thirds of all Christians are in the non-Western global South. By 2050, 77% of all Christians will live in the non-Western global South south the future of christianity therefore is african it's asian 
That's where the very future of Christianity is. Therefore, it's atrocious that we have categories like African theology and Asian theology, whilst European and American theology is simply called theology. That, that's wrong. It should be called European theology or American theology, if we're going to keep the distinctives. It's wrong. All of it is theology. OK, all of it is. The church fathers who most shaped Christian theology early on, think of Athanasius, think of Cyril, think of Augustine. They're all Africans. They're two Egyptians and one Algerian. Like Peter, we must proclaim God does not show favoritism in dealing with people, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is welcomed before him. Those God fearers. So in Acts 10, uh, 44 to 48, we read, whilst Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on those who heard his message. The circumcised believers who had accompanied Peter were greatly astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Then they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, no one can withhold the water for these people to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And then he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And he asked them to stay for several days. So here we see another barrier fall. The same spirit of God who comes and dwells within that European family who Peter was happy to write off as defiled and unclean. That's a wonderful testimony, isn't it? The Spirit of God comes and dwells within the hearts of everyone who worships the God of Israel, who acknowledges Jesus as the Messiah. And I love that last line, when they asked him to stay for several days. You can just imagine this, you know, um, Peter is wanting to write off these people as defiled and unclean. Um, and yet they then say, will you stay with us for a while? And immediately after this event, it causes fallout. We read in Acts 11, 2 to 3. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believer took issue with him, saying, you went into uncircumcised men and you shared a meal with them. You can just imagine it, can't you? Uh, these are believers. Um, and yet they're unable to see past some of their cultural identity. They take issue with Peter for sharing food with those unclean Europeans rather than with rejoicing that non-Jews um, are following the Jewish Messiah, that the, the descendants of Noah, that these um, people of Noah who worship the God of Israel, who acknowledge that the one who walked with Adam, the one who walked, who spoke to Abraham, the one who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. This Jesus is the Messiah. He was born of Mary of the line of David. So that Jesus is the Messiah. And they, they just can't get their heads around it. Why are you eating with these uncircumcised people? And this is a question that's going to come up again and again throughout the mission fields of Turkey and Greece. How Jewish do non-Jewish followers of the Jewish Messiah have to become? It's a question that we'll look about when we get to Acts 15 and others. How Jewish do non-Jewish followers of a Jewish Messiah have to become? Do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to give up pork and other things? Um, how Jewish do they need to become? For those Jewish things aren't bad. They're not bad at all. They're given by God. It is God who gave the law of Moses. It's, they're not bad things. They're, they're God given. Um, but it's for those who are who are from the nations, those who are from far off places. How, how much of that do they need to obey in order to be part of the people of God, to be part of the body of the Messiah, to be indwelt with the spirit of God? OK, and this is the first challenge that Peter receives hot off the press as Cornelius's conversion, as the barriers are breaking down and the spirit comes and indwells these people. And it's a guard for all of us that we don't put up barriers that God has ripped down, 
Don't put up barriers that God is tearing down. Um, and in conclusion, we must uh, rejoice in Paul's words to the Galatians in Galatians 3, 28. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And this is our new reality. We are in the Messiah. We are a new nation under a new king. Uh, our citizenship is in heaven and the stories that we've been told to look at today are God's heart for all people. God's heart for all people. Uh, for the African sat in his chariot reading from Isaiah. For the European who Peter didn't even want to eat with, God's heart is for everyone. And in the words of Peter, God does not show favoritism in dealing with people, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is welcomed in his sight, is welcomed before him. That's wonderful. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this message today of inclusivity, of how the spirit is breaking down those barriers between people and creating us as the kingdom of God within the kingdom of the Messiah a one nation under Jesus as king. And we pray, Lord, that if uh, we're failing in that, if we're erecting barriers within uh, that don't, shouldn't exist, that you would cause us to repent and to break down those barriers, Lord, we pray. In the name of Jesus, the Messiah. Amen.